Hello. In today's lecture, we'll talk again, continue with our transformation. But today we'll talk about rotation. You remember we've, we have discussed uh, the three rigid forms of transformation, which is translation, reflection, and today we'll talk about rotation. A rotation is also a rigid transformation, meaning that its object is exactly the same as the image that we get after the transformation. So after any object has been um, transformed through a rotation, the image that we get eventually is exactly the same. So that means um, that's why we, uh, that is a, a rotation transformation. Now, there are three important points that uh, govern a rotation transformation. One, a rotation must have a point of rotation. So there must be a specific point at which the object is being rotated. Then there has also got to be a rotational distance, which is really angular. There has got to be a rotational distance or an angular distance through which the rotation takes place. And the third and final one is that there must be a direction of the rotation. It is either rotated clockwise or anti-clockwise. So the three main points to bear in mind when a transformation undergoes a rotation is rather when an, an, an object undergoes a rotational transformation, uh, one, there must be a point of rotation. Two, there must be a distance through which it gets rotated, and this is angular distance. So that means the distance will be defined in angle, in, in degrees then there also has got to be the direction through which the rotation takes place. So it's either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So we'll say that the image, the object, is rotated uh, at about a particular point. So the image, the object is rotated about the point A through, we define the distance, through... Uh, say 90 degrees, which would be the angular distance, and the direction is clockwise or anti-clockwise. So that's how we define a rotation. And uh, um, I would like to urge you that there will be some questions on rotation. So therefore, you'll be probably, you'll have a, a Cartesian system, and within a Cartesian system, there will probably be a, a triangle, and you'll be asked to rotate it to find its image after it has undergone a particular rotation through about a certain center, uh, through a certain number of degrees in, in the cl either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So let us look at how we, we work that out. I have drawn this particular triangle. A triangle ABC, ABC, um, triangle ABC undergoes a 90, let's say it undergoes a 90 degrees, 90 degrees rotation, 90 degrees rotation about this center. If it's about the center, therefore it will be at 0, 0, clockwise. Clockwise, that means it is going in that, it's going to go in that direction. So one, we are told this triangle undergoes a 90 degrees rotation to about the center. So it will be, uh, be about that point there, which is the center, um, and the direction is clockwise. Now, if we go back, these are very important instruments that any teacher teaching transformation must have, especially the ruler is because you, in most cases you are going to draw the Cartesian system and your dimensions must be correct. That's about the ruler. Then you also must have a protractor. The protractor would be, uh, would be very important. Now, this is the divider. The divider is going to help you to, prep, to mark the angle. And, of course, you will need a pencil and a pencil. 
transformation, when you are teaching transformation, ensure that your children are using uh, pencils and not a pen. So let's go back to our diagram. So then we are given ABC and we are asked to rotate this triangle 90 degrees to, uh, to go through a 90 degrees rotation about the center or about the origin. Sometimes that is regarded as the origin. About the origin clockwise. So with my protractor, I would therefore place it down. Now, the basic things that I always teach the students is with a rotation, you must first of all look at the arms that are going to be rotated. So that means, let us say we drew that. We are rotating it about that. So what we are being told is that this OA is going to undergo a 90 degrees rotation. So it is going to form an angle of 90 degrees. So we place our protractor at this point here and calculate our 90 degrees. So we would place the protractor there and the 90 degrees is about there. So then I'll get my ruler and draw that the distance from there through to 90 degrees. So what that tells me is that this line O to A will now be O to A A prime. But I don't know where A prime is yet. But all I know is that A prime must be on this line somewhere. So I've drawn A prime. Now, how am I going to know where A prime is? All I need to do is use my ruler and find this distance from O to A. And the distance from O to A, that, from O to A, is about 3.2. So I'll place it, my ruler again on that line and look for 3.2, which is about there. So that means that is where my A prime will be. Next, I draw a line from O to C. Let me use that color. From O to C. Sorry. That is not. A line from O to C. The line from O to C would be, again, that's my C there. Now, I need to find what happens after it undergoes a 90 degrees rotation about there. So I again place my protractor, I again place my protractor there and look for 90 degrees, there's my 90 degrees and draw a line from O to C prime. From O to C prime, which is that. But therefore, there's my 90 degrees there. From O to C prime. But I do not know exactly where C prime is. But all I know is that OC has undergone a 90 degrees rotation about O clockwise. So clockwise, again, all my rotations are that way. So clockwise, therefore, my C prime must be on this line somewhere. For me to determine it, I measure this distance and measure it against that. So that distance is, that distance from there to there is 2. Therefore, I look for 2 here on this line and there is my 2 there. 
Therefore, that becomes my C prime. So my C, my OC has undergone a 90 degrees rotation about O. To find, therefore, that line OC becomes that, but to find exactly where my C prime is, I measure that distance against that, and I found it to be there. Therefore, that's where my C prime will be. Next is to determine my B. So I'll determine my B, my OB. So that is the OB. It undergoes a 90 degrees rotation this way. So I again place my protractor at the center of that. And my 90 degrees is there. Then I draw the line now, my line OB prime. That is my OB prime. But I do not know exactly where my point B prime is. So for me to find that point, I go back to my OB and measure the distance. The distance OB, O to B, is 3 centimeters. Therefore, I measure it against here. Again, 3 centimeters, which is there. Therefore, my B, my actual B prime will be there. Now, for me to find the transformation now of A, B, C, I've no, I know that my A prime is there, my B prime is there, and there is my C prime. So all I do is connect these points. I will now have used my green, I will now use the blue. Connect these points. C prime to B prime, B prime to O prime, rather to A prime, and A prime to B prime. Therefore, that gives me the transformation, that should be a 90 degrees, that gives me the transformation of the triangle A a, B, C, after undergoing a 90 degrees rotation about the center, 0, 0, in the direction clockwise. So if you look at every line, you'd see that this, that line there has undergone a 90 degrees to be along that line there. Then for me to find this distance from there to there, which is O to A, I measure, I put my ruler here and find that distance. That distance was about six centimeters. Then I measure it along here now and my six centimeters was there. That means the whole of that line O A underwent a 90 degrees rotation about the center and it became that line. Then for me to find that point, I measured that distance against that and that's where my A prime was. I did the same for, for C. There is my C. So OC is that line there. So I measured that line. Again, let me use the correct um, in, uh, coloring. I measured that line, which was my OC put my protractor along this line and measured 90 degrees and that gave me the 90 degrees. So my line OC came along here and I got that to be my OC prime. Now, for me to determine where this point is on that line, I measured this distance using a ruler. From there to there, it was three centimeters. Therefore, I measured from there to that point that gave me the three centimeters. So that's where my C prime 
was. Then the next thing, well, that was somewhere there. Then the next thing was now to find my line OB, which is that which has undergone a 90 degrees transformation. That means it underwent a 90 degrees transformation. Therefore, I placed my protractor there, measured 90 degrees, and 90 degrees was along this line here. There. Therefore, I now draw a line from O to B prime that way, in that direction. Now, for me to find exactly where B prime is, I had to measure this distance, which was four centimeters, and I measured it against here. There was my four centimeters. So that means that's where my B prime was. Now, to find the actual image then of the triangle T after undergoing a 90 degrees rotation about the center clockwise, I drew it against the points that I found, and that was my triangle. That was 90 degrees. That was my triangle, which is my T prime. So that is how you actually find the image of any given object after undergoing a particular uh, um, transformation in terms of a rotational transformation. So then, the most important things to remember is one, you need to know the direction, the point at which it is being rotated, as well as the angular distance, the number of degrees. Now, if it was 60 degrees, we would have measured it through 60 degrees. So we place our protractor here and check for 60 degrees through there. But what you have to remember again is you need to draw these lines because these are the lines that are going to be to undergo a particular rotation. Then for you to determine, after you have drawn these lines, you now determine how, what happens when this line undergoes that particular rotation. In this case, it was a 90 degrees. So it underwent a 90 degrees and that line became that line. Now, for us to find now where that, that is my, that was my A, that's my A, for me to find my A prime along this line, which is its image, I would need to measure this distance using a ruler. And it gave me six centimeters. Then I measure six centimeters along here. And it was found to be there. That, that's how I got my A prime. And I do exactly the same for the others as well. So there will be some questions on, um, on uh, transformation uh, geometry, of course, and uh, you'll have some. Um, you'll have to do some calculations uh, around finding images of objects that have undergone uh, a rotational transformation. So try some of the exercises in your uh, learning guide. Um, I'm, I'm available, so just uh, send me a WhatsApp and. Uh, or text me, and I should be able to, to respond to any of your questions. Now, next we are going to look at um, tessellation. To tessellate really means to tile. So, when if a tessellation is when a surface is covered with, a flat, with flat shapes without leaving a gap and no overlaps. So this, therefore, is a tessellation. These are tiles in my house. So the tiles were tessellated. What, is, what happened is that this particular surface from here to there and there to there was tessellated. So the tiles are exactly the same. And they cover the distance without leaving any gaps in between them, you know. So that's what we call a tessellation. So a tessellation really is a coverage of any given space with the shapes that are exactly the same, such that they do not overlap or leave gaps. In other words, you are not seeing a tile that is lying on top of another tile. So the one tile comes and meets with the other tile and then the other one is, uh, comes next to it. The next other example that I've provided is that of the bricks Again, this is a good example of tessellation. 
uh, tessellation of bricks on a wall, there is a repetition of the bricks over and over again, forming a pattern. So you can see the bricks are being repeated over and over, but none of the bricks is lying on top of the other, and they form a particular pattern. So this is what is called a tessellation. And you'll be also asked to probably to develop different tessellations using different shapes. For instance, you might be asked to develop a tessellation that involves um, uh, triangles or a tessellation that re involves um, uh, cuboids, uh, that tessellation involving squares and so on. So you should be able to, to know what to do. A tessellation is a formation of a pattern with shapes that are exactly the same and do not overlap and or lie on top of, of each other. So that's that really. So we will regard this as our last lecture of the of the semester. And um, again, these are topics that you will definitely be teaching, I think, round about in grade three. Your grade three children will have to look at tessellation and do not provide them with your tessellations. Let them come with their own examples of tessellations and they'll provide you with varieties. The most important thing is for you to ensure that they understand the concept. All right. I wish you all the best in the exam. Bye then.